Uh, my name is Frode Mørkedal. I'm an analyst at uh, Clarkson Securities in Oslo. I'm here to moderate the dry bulk panel. So we have a very good panel here today. Um, we have Costa at the uh, Eagle Bulk Shipping. We have John Woburn Smith at Jenko Shipping. Ed Buttery at uh, Taylor Mar Maritime Investments. Uh, Stamatis Tantanis at uh, Sea Energy. And Hamish Norton at Starbulk. So I would like uh, each uh, of you to basically spend one or two minutes each introduce yourself and your company, um, focus on the fleet, performance, um, you know, strategy. Uh, let's start with you, Costa. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Costa Tutsopidis, the Chief Strategy Officer at Eagle Bulk. Um, our CEO, Gary Vogel, was meant to be on this panel today, but unfortunately and probably conveniently tested positive with COVID yesterday. And uh, unfortunately for me, he only gave me eight hours notice for this. Uh, so apologies in advance if I uh, don't seem prepared. Um, for those of you not familiar with Eagle, we are a US-based New York Stock Exchange listed ship owner, operator, focused exclusively on the mid-sized dry bulk vessel segment. Um, we own a fleet of 55 ships, 91%, which are scrubber fitted. That makes us the largest owner of mid-sized scrubber fitted ships in the world with about a 15% market share. Uh, we employ an active management um, uh, in terms of our fleet trading and with the objective to outperform the market. And I think over the years, we've demonstrated our ability to do so. In uh, 2022, we outperformed the market by about $6,000 a day and generated a record profit of $250 million. And we paid out roughly $105 million in dividends to our shareholders. Um, we are quite active on this S&P front. Um, over the past few months, we bought uh, four ships, spending about $110 million in, in actively uh, renewing and growing the fleet at, um, at a point where we think um, values seem interesting again after peaking last June. Um, and we ended the year on a very strong financial note um, with low net debt to fleet percentage um, and really strong liquidity of about $300 million. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Perfect. John? Great. <clears throat> I'm John Wobin Smith, CEO of Genco Shipping. Um, we are uh, also US based, traded on the New York Stock Exchange. We have a fleet of 44 vessels, um, and uh, we have what we call, like to call our barbell approach, where we have direct exposure to all the dry bulk commodities. So we have a fleet of cape sized vessels, and then we also have a fleet of mid sized vessels. If you uh, take a look at what we've done over the last uh, few years, we have done what I would say is massive deleveraging. We've paid off about 65% of our debt, so our net debt to, uh, to value right now is uh, hovering around 10%. The goal was to be net debt zero by the end of, uh, of this year, and that looks like uh, we'll, it w is within reach right now. Along with paying off all of that debt, we've put into place our value strategy. We think we've created the best, best risk reward model in dry bulk shipping with a very low leverage profile, a very low break even on a, from a cash flow standpoint of about $9,000 a day all in, um, which allows us to pay uh, high dividends and return capital to, uh, to shareholders. Along with that, um, about Four years ago, we put a pretty in-depth strategic plan in place. Deleveraging was part of that, but also building out a robust commercial platform. Um, and we've created uh, a very good owner-operator model. We've outperformed the market for the past four years above our above the uh, above our benchmarks and the indices. So I, you know, right now we are um, very well set up for what we think, uh, particularly as we get into the second half of this year and into next year. Um, a robust dry bulk market. Okay, next. Ed? Hi, I'm Ed Buttery, uh, CEO of Taylor Maritime Investments, uh, which we listed almost two years ago on the London Stock Exchange as a close ended uh, fund. Uh, that's to say, we focus on um, high payout uh, or steady payout of 8% annualized, um, low debt. Um, we're focused on the handy size segment. We have a fleet at the moment of 26 Japanese handy size vessels. Uh, at the end of last year, at the dip of the market, 
uh, we uh, made a transformational uh, investment um, and bought 83% of Grinrod shipping, which is listed here on the NASDAQ stock exchange. Uh, so the fleet now totals about 56 ships with uh, a young fleet of uh, high quality Japanese Ultramax vessels that predominantly trade in the Indian Ocean. We have about 30% cargo coverage uh, throughout the, both companies. We trade less than 5% coal. Uh, we're targeting zero coal on our fleet. Um, and uh, we outperformed the market last year by 34%. Uh, we like to think that we've made a, a timely investment uh, and increased our leverage to do that to 30% uh, to take over Grinrod. Um, but we're targeting to be below 25% loan to value by June and much closer to zero net debt by the end of the year. Um, I think that's uh, about it. Thank you. Thank you. Stamatis? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Stamatis Chantanis. I am the chairman and uh, CEO of uh, Athens-based uh, Synergy Maritime Holdings. We have a fleet of uh, 17 cape size vessels with a dead weight of about uh, 3 million uh, tons. Uh, we own and operate everything in-house. Uh, and uh, we generally believe in uh, a balanced strategy in expanding the fleet as well as shareholder returns. Over the last two years, we have spent more than $250 million in an opportunistic acquisition of uh, high quality Cape size vessels, all of them built in uh, Japan and uh, South Korea. Uh, we have generally overperformed the market uh, anywhere between 25 and 40% due to our uh, very smart commercial strategy. And we have paid approximately 30% return to our investors in the form of dividends in 2022, and we will continue a high payout scheme. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Hamish Norton, president of Starbolt Carriers Corp. We're the largest listed dry bulk company. Um, we have 128 vessels, uh, of which 120 have scrubbers. Uh, the vessels run the gamut from uh, Super maxes of 52,000 tons to Newcastle maxes of 209,000 tons. Uh, we have very roughly a, th a third of the fleet in the Supermax, Ultramax class, a third in the, in the Panamax, Camser Max class, and a, and a third in the Cape size Newcastle Max class. So, um, you know, the, 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 the fleet is divided more or less evenly. The, the investment tends to be weighted toward the larger ships. Um, we uh, you know, pay a lot of attention to corporate governance, as, as I'm, I'm sure most of, most of my peers do, but we, we, uh, we have a very serious board. Uh, we have uh, uh, financial investors on the board. We have actually ship owners who have merged their companies into STAR and remain as shareholders of STAR on our board. Um, as a result, the executive team are really incentivized very strongly to act and think like shareholders. We are shareholders. And as a result, we've got our costs down to the lowest in the industry. Uh, you know, the sum of our operating expense and uh, overhead per ship per day is basically lower than anybody else's, uh, in some cases by thousands of dollars a day. Um, and uh, our chartering results are excellent. And as a result, we think that ships in our hands are actually worth more than, than ships in the hands of others in many cases. Um, and uh, we have a very uh, uh, clear dividend policy that basically calls for cash from operations in excess of $2.1 million per ship to be paid out. Um, and we've paid out uh, over $5 a share in the last uh, 12 months. Um, and, um, you know, but at the same time, before making that payout, we pay down about $200 million of debt per year. Basically, all of our amortization is, is uh, paid down rather than refinanced. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Uh, I plan to go through a few slides, just to show you a couple of charts to have in the, before we start the discussion. So as an analyst, uh, you know, the first uh, point to make out is always the order book. Um, 
And this is a fantastic story for Drybook. You can look at this chart. Uh, it's showing you the order book as a percent of the fleet since the early 80s. And basically today we are at 7% uh, order book. And unless there's uh, any major new orders coming in, uh, this order book will drop down to just 3.6% by the end of this year. So super low order book, uh, and, and that of course is uh, very important to keep in mind. And of course that leads to very low fleet growth, right? So this shows you the net fleet growth in the same period. So we're basically assuming one to 2% net fleet growth. This is deliveries uh, after some minor scrapping, right? So very low fleet growth on top of this, which we'll probably discuss later, is uh, you know the effect of slow steaming, and um, that will basically bring it down lower. Uh, yeah, Clarkson's view, uh, by the way, is that uh, slow steaming could be three percent hmm. for dry book. So essentially, you will have a zero to negative fleet growth uh, for the foreseeable future. So of course, that means uh, that you don't have to believe much in terms of demand to see a recovery, right? And that's uh, uh, and the main pushback we always get is uh, what do you think about the real estate in China? And you know, that's uh, not a very good story, but the good thing is that you don't have to believe in that uh, at all, right? So in our own forecast, we think uh, iron, iron ore trade, that's the left uh, charts or bars, is going to be flat. So we don't perceive any major improvement for iron ore trade. Uh, the two other commodities, or the two other major commodities, are grain and coal. Uh, you can see coal in the middle. Obvious that in this energy crisis we have, uh, we have a very strong demand for coal. It's going to rise by 3%. And then grain, fantastic crops of soybeans, etc., in various regions. So very strong volume growth for grains, uh, around 5%. So basic point is that grain and coal combined is more than enough to absorb the net fleet growth. And so you don't have to take a view on the China steel and the real estate's um, outlook. Of course, if China grows, and that's been a recent trend, you know, that could be a bonus, essentially. Uh, keep in mind that we are, uh, you know, essentially with no fleet growth, uh, we just a small increment in demand has a huge impact on rates. So this chart shows you on the what we call capacity utilization and uh, what the impact is on rates. Uh, so on the left you have the capes, and on the right you have a supermax. Point is that if you start off by where we are today. Let's say uh, you can basically see it in there, just a 1% or 2% increase has a very meaningful improvement in day rates. Uh, when I look at the equities out there, um, today the most expensive dry bulk equity out there is trading at uh, 18,000 per day cape size. Most of the other names are trading around 15, 16,000 per day. So that's what the stock market is predicting in, in the equities. So, and then, of course, if you have just a higher day rate than that, uh, obviously there should be higher upside potential in the names. I'll, uh, yeah, this is a very important graph, I think. I started off saying that this is all about supply, but uh, we also have a very uh, constructive demand story uh, in terms of China, right? So. China has put out their growth targets for this year. Um, this is a chart showing you GDP in red, the official GDP numbers that nobody really believes in, I think. Uh, but um, <laughs> because last year they claimed they grew, grew 3%, uh, which is uh, very unrealistic given that the whole country was closed down for uh, at least a quarter. So. I, I like this uh, Capital Economics, which is a consultancy, macro consultancy. They have this uh, proxy indicator, basically building up a GDP indicator based on you know, highly visible 
data points like uh, car sales and passenger traffic, etc. Right, and they claim that China uh, Chinese GDP in reality fell two percent last year. And then, of course, if you have a growth of five and uh, probably even more, that's a meaningful improvement. So uh, I'll start the panel here, um, and I'd like all of you to basically tell you or tell everybody else about uh, your dry bulk outlook. Um, if there's anyone that disagrees with this, uh, what I just presented, feel free to say so. Um, unless, let's, uh, who wants to go first? Costa? Sure, I mean, I, I, I think we would agree with uh, your general assessment. Um, on the order book uh, slide, I think an, an important overlay to that is the fleet age profile which you know, at the moment, you know, the, at least in the HandyMax uh, segment, uh, the fleet age is gonna be around 12 years of age within the next year or two, which you know, could be the oldest uh, fleet we've had in recorded history, overlay that with the lowest order book. So it just kind of underscores and the, the supply side uh, fundamentals. Um, we do think um, that ordering could tick up this year. Uh, it won't be anything meaningful, but I think with the with decarbonization and the question mark on that and, and not having real visibility, visibility over the next few years, you know, I think we could see owners order conventional ships. But again, nothing impactful. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. about this? Well, about China, I mean, it's kind of hard to start looking for a new home when you're locked in in your existing one for three years. So. We're seeing now the new houses uh, finally rebounding, the new house, the price of the new houses finally rebounding. And also don't forget that you have one of the highest savings rates uh, per household in the recent history. So all that money, which is significantly higher than Europe or the United States as a percentage of the household, uh, have to be spent somewhere. I don't think that the Chinese will spend all of that in consumption. I think a lot of that will go into the housing market. And combined with the uh, construction projects and all the infrastructure, I think it's going to be a very strong demand driver. Yeah. John? <clears throat> yeah, so I'll, I'll disagree with you a little bit. Okay, that's on good. One, on one side of it, we, we need China. Um, we, we cannot rely just on grain and coal and not take China into account. Um, you, you go back historically, China makes up 35 to 40 percent of dry bulk demand. If you actually look at GDP numbers and freight rates, there's a 70, 75 percent correlation between the two. By the way, the number is basically zero for the U.S. and, and maybe one to two percent for, for Europe. So in the end of the day, it's China. That's where I'll disagree with you on. But the good news is, you know, we're seeing everything flashing green uh, in China right now. You pointed out the GDP number. Hard to tell, as you said, what exactly uh, was the GDP number last year, but no doubt it's going to be significantly higher uh, this year. We've already started to see it with iron ore flows. We've already started to see it with uh, consumer spending in China. The uh, steel price is, is firming. Inventories are low, so the, the, the steel is actually being used. And, you know, look, our, our view overall is that we've seen this story before, and I think, it, I think history will repeat itself. And what I mean by that is China came out of the global financial crisis first. China came out of the 2020-2021 COVID lockdowns first. Um, they have gone to, I, I wouldn't say they are stimulating like they did in those periods, but they, they have put quite a bit of stimulus in place, and our view is, that hasn't really begun to kick in yet. You're going to start to see that towards the second half of the year. Um, and then as we get into next year with the low supply situation, which you pointed out, which is, you know, it's just, it's, it's sort of all we talk about, but it is the most important thing. The, the dry bulk market, in our view, um, has quite a lot of legs to run here uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I'm going to talk about it a bit about my own book, <laughs> but um, I think generally speaking, the outlook is positive for dry bulk, but we mustn't forget that sentiment right now, especially around SVB and the Credit Suisse crisis, leaves jitters in the market 
uh, that uh, create very volatile uh, price reactions and share prices, and we saw that last week across the whole market. That being said, the fundamentals of dry bulk, which is what I focus on, I'm sure a lot of us focus on, do look very good. In the handy size segment uh, alone, you've got 15% um, of the order book, uh, sorry, 10% of the order book over 25, 26 years old, reaching scrapping age in the next year or two. Um, you've got minor bulk demand uh, versus handy size ship supply at about a 5% spread between now and the end of 2024. If someone wanted to go out and order a ton of ships in order to upset the supply demand imbalance, it would be almost impossible to do that and take delivery of that many ships <clears throat> in the next two or three years. There's simply not enough space to build handies um, in Japan. Uh, the next available slot available uh, is probably the second half of 26 um, for, a, for a couple of handies. You might get one or two slots at the early part of 2026, but you're talking about a handful of slots between now and June 26. Nothing like the hundreds of ships that we think are in shortage in our space. Uh, and, and that shortage is going to be exacerbated by uh, the slowing down through uh, speed limiters uh, and uh, ESG regulations. So the outlook's very good. I think for, for handy size, I don't think China needs to boom. I don't, I don't think uh, this is a boom story for us. Uh, I think what we need is for China to grow. And it's clear that it almost certainly is going to be growing. And because of where the order book is, there's a very compelling fundamental story uh, for the outlook for our industry. And as long as you know, you've got low leverage, um, and as long as you've got good payout uh, um, policies, uh, and you've got the right ships, which is also very important, I think you could see a very rosy uh, investment picture for those interested in being in dry bulk in the coming few years. Yeah. You know, as, as far as we can tell, I, I basically agree with John Wobensmith's analysis of, of the market. You know, we're optimistic about coal and grain, um, but we don't think coal and grain are going to carry the market by themselves. You know, we think iron ore is important, but frankly, we think iron ore is going to be moving more and more. Um, we, we do see uh, China uh, increasing production of steel. Um, we actually anticipate some backhaul cargoes of, of steel coils, uh, you know, coming back from the Pacific to to the Atlantic. Um, and um, you know, uh, one other thing to keep in mind um, uh, is that uh, when you showed rates as a function of utilization, uh, of course, the fuel price is a very important component of that. The higher the fuel price, the higher the rate at a given level of utilization. And while fuel prices have dropped recently, uh, we don't think that that, you know, is going to continue very much. I mean, you know, the people are going to need to burn fuel oil for a while. And, uh, you know, the investment in, in drilling for oil has been very, very low. And you know we think that, that oil is going to be in, in in shorter and shorter supply, and you know the the low carbon and zero carbon fuels are even more expensive, uh, and and you know basically the higher the fuel price goes, the higher the charter rates go, and uh, you know uh, frankly uh, soon enough. Um, the regulation combined with the low order book is going to, you know, re regulatory uh, influence is going to cause older, less fuel efficient ships to be pushed out of the fleet. You don't need a lot of ships to be pushed out of the fleet for rates to go sky high. Yeah. Well, I kind of disagree with that, to be honest, because the last couple of years that we saw very steep increases in the rates when dry bulk went up to $80,000 a day, the cape sizes and all that, the fuel prices were actually quite low. So if you think about that, the actual price that people pay for a commodity transported is kind of a given. It ranges. I mean, for example, iron ore is between, let's say, $10 in Australia and $30 in, in, 
from Brazil. So it's pretty much a given thing. So if you have expensive fuel price, <laughs> that takes away the profit from, you know, from the daily rate. So well, it doesn't really work like that. Well, I don't uh, see that. With high fuel prices, ships will slow down unless rates are high. We, again, we didn't see that. Well, yeah, you, demand can always move rates up the average, without fuel prices going up. But the average if, fleet speed this last year and the year before was pretty much the same and you had double the fuel price. So we didn't really see that. It's the regulations that will slow down the ships, not the fuel price. We haven't seen that. Well, I, you know, I, the, Hamish, I'll, I'll agree with you on, uh, on, the, on the slow steaming. Um, and I actually think you're gonna be able to move up that chart a lot faster because of the environmental regulations that, that you started to bring up. You know, our view is that it's not necessarily that the fleet is going to slow down because we actually, if you, think the, the fleet is already running at a pretty uh, slow speed right now. But what we do believe is, again, as we get in more and more into this recovery, ships will not speed up like they have in the past, which means that utilization chart and those rates will move up that much quicker than what we've seen um, historically. Yeah, I agree with that. We've, in, on the handy size segment, we've seen a slowdown uh, in a sort of 10 plus year old ships of one to one and a half knots. Um, Jeffrey's had a really good stat on that. Um, for every knot, one knot slowed down or half a knot slowed down. Omar, you're in here somewhere, aren't you? For every half a, half a knot slowed down in the fleet, 3% of the fleet gets removed from the supply. Now, obviously in, in handies, it's uh, not quite as um, a strong effect uh, because we spend 50% of our time in port, but bigger sizes, uh, there'll be a much more pronounced effect. But, and I agree with John, the fleet has already basically slowed down a little bit, certainly in our segment, um, just a little bit. Um, so we, and I don't think it's gonna speed up. I know, sorry. There you go. Perfect. I would just add one data point on China that kind of underscores the positive sentiment and it's, um, it relates to the S&P activity. During the second half of last year, the Chinese did not seem to be in the market at all on the buy side. Um, you know, we know this because we're actively, you know, buying and selling ships. And you know, over the past couple of months, the Chinese have definitely been there in the market. You know, we sold our oldest ship to a Chinese uh, local buyer recently, and I think that's a just it's a positive indication uh, for local sentiment. Perfect. Yeah. So. Um Moving on to the next slide, it's uh, the order book, I guess. Um, so this one, just showing that again, very low order book. Um, so this, the title here is capital allocation. Um, so feel free to discuss both the order book and the supply side. But um, of course, capital allocation means should you invest in the fleet or should you pay out dividends, pay back debt, etc. So what's your priorities, uh, given this good market outlook, I guess? What's your, uh, who wants to, um, Hamish? Hamish? Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, you know, at, at, this, at this moment, um, we don't think it's a good idea to order new buildings. Um, we think new buildings are too expensive, that, uh, you know, if you want a relatively new ship, a relatively new ship on the water is a better deal. Uh, you know, the shipyards don't have an incentive to cut price because they're full of orders for container ships and LNG carriers that are more profitable. Uh, but also, we still don't think the right ship for 2030 is available. And we think it's not gonna be too much longer before it is available. And so we think that people who order ships today will probably regret not having waited. Now, of course, at the same time, you don't have to wait too long until there is just a huge built up shortage of ships, that, which will you know, push rates up for, for probably many years to come. Um, so we're, we're basically using our capital to pay dividends. And uh, you know, we believe that when there are attractive investment projects that will have attractive access to the capital markets. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would, I, I would agree with Hamish. Um, 
But I'd also say in this interest rate environment, get, get, pay off all your debt. You know, you're saving, you're saving seven, eight, nine percent, depending on who you've borrowed from and who you are. But that's big bucks in this market. So for Taylor Maritime, my focus is very heavily on uh, getting that debt way down. Um, ordering new buildings, you put down a 15, 20% deposit in Japan, you're waiting two years before you start steel cutting, a year and a half to two years, uh, and that money's tied up. So uh, what I would say on handies uh, specifically, which may be different for the Capes and the, and the VLOCs and Newcastle Maxes, is that because we call so many different types of ports, we're going to be on some form of fuel oil or diesel uh, for a very long time. The technology uh, isn't affordable on our ship size, it's not available, and that's before you even contemplate changing the infrastructure for the variety of ports where we call. So pay off debt, uh, that's where I'm putting my money, and keep your investors happy. Okay. Uh, sure, I'll go. Uh, for us, I mean, it's really all the above. Um, you know, we were quite acquisitive late 20, early 21. Uh, we took a pause for about 18 months. Uh, prices and values peaked around June of uh, 22. And we came back into the market on the buy side in September after prices had came off about 20 or so percent. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we bought four ships. So we're, we're definitely investing uh, for growth here. Um, we also, of course, continue to divide, divest the older ships. Um, and, you know, it, it still seemed like good value, right? We, we bought uh, two 2020 Chinese scrubber fitted Ultramaxes for 30 million. You know, you could put those ships out for a year right now, probably at 19,000. Um, that, that generates a decent, uh, decent return. Um, we continue to distribute dividends, basis our uh, dividend policy of 30% of net income, uh, which we think is appropriate. Um, and of course, naturally delivering. We pay, we're paying down 50 million a year um, on our term loan. And uh, we bought back opportunistically 10 million of our convert in uh, Q3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for for Genco again, you know, our our primary focus over the last uh, couple years has been paying down debt. As I mentioned, we we paid off 65 percent of our of our debt over the last couple of years. We've put into place our value strategy, which is very very dividend focused in terms of, of a high payout, but also continuing to pay down debt and, and also keeping a reserve in place because ultimately you, uh, you need to renew your fleet. We did uh, quite a bit of fleet renewal uh, at the end of 21 in the early part of 22. We still have uh, what, what I would say some ships that are identified for sale from, to, uh, to trade up to newer ships, but I gotta tell you, it's, uh, it's a hard thing to pull the trigger right now because as we've seen rates come back, the return on invested capital numbers on, uh, <clears throat> on particularly older Japanese built ships um, are pretty good. And we've, uh, even on some of our older ships, we've installed energy saving devices to, uh, to be in compliance with IMO 2023 going forward. But we will continue to, to swap out, but uh, with, with values moving up right now, rates moving up right now, I think we're in a little bit of a hold position in terms of you know, disposing of, of any other assets. As Costa said, I, I think it's really interesting for, because uh, we're now back at the point where values and time charter rates seem to be synced up again. We certainly didn't see that at the end of last year and definitely not the early part of, uh, of this year. So we're starting to see a, a healthy relationship again between time charter rates and, uh, and values. So I think there's, there's some opportunities there. And then on the new build, I, I don't think there's anybody here that's going to advocate building new ships right now, um, our, ourselves included. Um, and, you know, I just keep going back to it. The, the supply situation that exists, you just don't need much incremental demand growth to continue to outstrip that and have rates get into that parabolic utilization that, uh, that we saw a few minutes ago on the slide. I, I would just add that uh, with regards, I was in Japan last week um, and I met with every major shipyard. They're pretty happy. <laughs> so their prices aren't coming down. They've got full order books for the next two years, lots of tankers, they've got lots of containers that still have to be built. You can't convert a container hull into a, t into a bulker hull, so you know, the swap out if the container market does really falter is not gonna happen really. These guys are sitting pretty, so for a dry bulk owner, it's time to wait 
um, be happy with the trade you've got on and focus on your debt. Yeah, well, no, no, so that's absolutely fine. I fully agree with everyone. It doesn't make any financial or technological sense to consider new buildings at these levels. Um, I mean, if you counterweight uh, $65 million for a new building delivered in 26 or $35 million for a high quality, let's say seven, eight years old ship that is going to make exactly the same revenue, uh, I don't really think it makes any sense. For us at Synergy, um, we have, um, you know, a certain reserve for fleet re replacement. We sell some of our older ships. We buy some middle-aged high-quality vessels that uh, are more tradable and commercially competitive. And at the same time, in 2022, we paid about 30% uh, dividend uh, yield to our investors. We buy back a lot of uh, securities and stock and all that. So not only we distribute a lot of capital, but we also create accretion to our shareholders by reducing the amount of shares that we have. Thank you. Okay. How about the um, uh, ship for share uh, transaction? Is that possible today? I mean, the the stocks were just a few weeks ago uh, above NAV. Um, now it's come down, I guess. But uh, how's the outlook there? Uh, is that possible? Anyone? Yeah. Sure. I can, I can start. For us, I don't think it's there yet. I mean, you know, you need really two things to happen, right? Your equity needs to be trading at par, at least to NAV. Uh, I don't think right now most of the peer group is is there. Um, secondly, you need a kind of a weak cash S&P market because generally a seller would prefer cash versus shares, um, especially traditional sellers. Uh, if you have a financial sponsor that is willing to take shares, you know that that could be uh, more doable. Um, but you know the last time we did ship with shares was early in 21 when both our valuation was was good relative to par. Um, and also the cash market, S&P market was weak. Okay. So it proved to be an opportune time. It was good for us and the sellers who, uh, who took shares. Okay. Anybody else? Uh... I mean, I, I think it's really tough right now. I mean, we're, we're in the full upside down world right now in terms of what's going on with share prices and, and the disconnect in, in value. So we you know, just over the last two weeks, we've seen values, particularly in the larger ships, uh, move upwards, but yet share prices move down. Rates, I think, are recovering faster than uh, what consensus was uh, a month ago. Um, obviously, there's a lot of noise in the in the equity markets today, and any any of the high beta stocks um, are are not performing well, including shipping. I mean, even the even the tanker equities have uh, have come off. So that will correct itself once the market realizes um, where things are going in the latter part of this year and into next year. But um, as Costa said, I think I think it's hard to hard to do right now with where the values are. Uh, I I think we don't know. Um, you know, in, in 2018 and 19, we did eight small M and A transactions and just about doubled the size of our fleet. Um, and then during the pandemic, we couldn't get anything closed. And now, you know, we're we're always looking at transactions. Um, you know, we haven't been able to close any for a while, but you know, I think the, the, the market may actually be moving more in the direction of, of being able to close some of these transactions. And you know, in, in 2018, uh, you know, I think almost all the transactions occurred when our share was actually trading below NAV, but we were able to negotiate transactions on the basis of NAV or better. So it's, it's not impossible, but you know, you, you don't know till it's done. Okay. Well, as far as we're concerned, uh, it's all about the value per share you present to uh, the investors and the shareholders. So we're in the process of reducing our share count, not increasing that. Perfect. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, so I just wanted to bring up the carbon regulations. Um, I guess, Ed, you mentioned that you don't want to transport coal. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Uh, uh, yeah, our handy sized fleet transports less than 1% sure. coal. That's uh, ultramaxes. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, we, we have a very strong ESG policy, uh, specifically with regards to the environment. And, um, and so we are targeting to offset as much as possible, as fast as possible. It's a big deal for us. We have a very young management team who grew up in an environment where uh, 
where uh, carbon footprint's very important to them personally and at work. Um, so, uh, you know, most of our fleet is now fitted with um, the energy saving devices we're required to do. We've spent about $350,000, $400,000 per ship across the entire fleet. Um, but I think this, all, all this is a really important step in the, in the, in the future of our, our world. And we're now single use plastic free on our ships across Grinrod and Taylor um, before we, we got rid of just plastic water bottles, we were consuming a million water bottles a year. Hmm. And now, zero. That's good. Uh, yeah, I guess we don't have really much time to discuss it, really. But uh, anyone who wants to summarize uh, these new rules and the implications on well, shipping? Well, look, I, I, I think the implications of the new rules are spectacularly good for dry bulk shipping. The, the more uh, serious the regulation, the more complex the regulation, the harder the regulation bites, the fewer ships will comply. Uh, and, you know, the more expensive new buildings will have to be ordered. And, you know, that could keep rates high, push rates up and keep rates high for a decade. As the fleet gets replaced, and uh, if I may add here, and I completely agree, we have long-term partnerships with uh, some of the world's largest uh, dry bulk charters, and uh, we have felt that it's kind of a two-tier market. Uh, some of them are very, very sensitive on the environment and the uh, emissions and the new regulations and everything, but uh, we see uh, a smaller portion of them still being in denial. Okay, CII, that's ship owner's problem. EXI, ship owner's problem. So if not all interests are fully aligned, then we're not gonna see any real breakthrough in that. So uh, I'm a believer that things will eventually uh, work out quite well, but we really need to see all the stakeholders, including the charters, to be in full alignment with the new regulations. Perfect. Okay, we are out of time, so I would like to thank you all, uh, the panelists. So. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.